Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the All Bible Prophecy Fulfilled podcast. I'm William Bell, and in this podcast, we're going to be talking about the promise of the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit was involved in accomplishing, perfecting, consummating the inheritance that was promised to us by God. We encourage you to open your Bibles, open your hearts, and open your mind, and allow God to open your understanding to his word. Now, in the previous study, we were looking at Galatians chapter 3, and I'll just touch on that very briefly so that we can have that information in our minds. Uh, We started in Galatians chapter 3 and the verse was 14. The Bible clearly pointed out that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So the scriptures speak of the promise which was to be received through the Spirit. And this was a covenant which God had made with Abraham. And so verse 15 says, Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. And this I say, that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant, that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. So this promise had been given by God. It is called the promise of the Spirit. It was given to Abraham 430 years before the law was given. This promise involves the inheritance which God has promised and blessed his children with. The scripture says in verse 18, which defines the premise as the inheritance, so note it very carefully, for if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So he's showing us that the promise of the spirit was the inheritance which God promised Abraham. Now, this is not the inheritance of the land. This is the inheritance of eternal life. That was the promise that God made to Abraham. Now, how do we know that is the case? It's because in verse 21, the Bible says, Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly, righteousness would have been by the law. So the promise that God gave to Abraham that involved our salvation was not a promise of land, and that is a notion that many people take regarding the promise made to Abraham. But the scripture tells us very clearly that it was not a promise of land, but a promise of life, life from the dead, not life from or physical resurrection, but life from the death of sin, the very sin committed in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. The scripture again, just to make this clear, says in verse 21, is the law then against the promises of God? Now, Paul is answering the question of uh, why or what purpose did the law serve? He said it was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Now, this tells you once again that the promise could not be the land Because Israel already had the land. They were already in the land. But God had to wait until 
the seed would come, that is, until Christ would come, before this promise could be delivered, before this promise could be granted and fulfilled. So what is it that was promised in addition to the land that they already had, or at least um, in contradistinction to the land they already had? It was the life that we find in Christ. So, what purpose then did the law serve? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. You recall when God made the promise to Abraham, he said, in your seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. And again, In your seed shall all the families be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So this promise would not be fulfilled until the seed would come. And of course, the seed is Christ. So in verse 21, when he says, is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law which could have given life. That's the definition of the promise. That's the meaning of the promise. That is the promise that had to await the coming of the seed, the Lord Jesus Christ, before it could be granted. And thus, he says, if the law could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. Now, that also renames the promise as righteousness. And that's why we spoke of that in terms of what the Holy Spirit was bringing. So the Holy Spirit was bringing a blessing of life to the world. And that's why it's also called the spirit of life. Now that we've seen what the premise is, we can see that if you belong to Christ, you become an heir of the promise. You receive the promise. So let's go to Ephesians and speak more about the promise that was made by the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 1, starting with verse 11, the Bible says, In him also we have obtained an inheritance. See, notice that this inheritance is in Christ. It's not in the land, but it's in Christ. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him... There it is again. Notice where the promise is being given. In him, not in the land. See, everything that was spoken of to Moses regarding the inheritance that God was giving Israel back in the Exodus was the land. I am giving you this land, this good land, this land flowing with milk and honey. But here... When the Bible speaks about the premise, and particularly about the premise of the Holy Spirit, it is in him, not in the physical land. Christ is our spiritual land. And so in him, you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So here we are again. Uh, We can see that this promise was through the Holy Spirit, through the sealing of the Holy Spirit. And this represents a miraculous sealing. And the scripture will further define it as the earnest of the Spirit, sometimes called the guarantee. He says, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until 
the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Once again, we find that the ministry of the Holy Spirit is found within the scope of time because it is until the redemption of the purchased possession. Now remember in Hebrews 9, verses 8 and 9, where he says that there were carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Um, That's Hebrews 9, 10, and 11. It was imposed upon them until the time of reformation. Well, here he says that the Holy Spirit, that is the guarantee or the earnest of the Spirit, of the inheritance was until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So what does the text mean about the earnest of the spirit? That's the word guarantee in the new King James version. In other versions, it is the word earnest, but what does it mean? And uh, from whence does it come? What we have Uh, is the word guarantee in the original language. It is the word Arabon, or Arabon. And it has a specific meaning relative to the work of the Holy Spirit, so that we can see both the temporal nature of this function of the Holy Spirit in terms of what is called the earnest, so that we can distinguish it from the person of the Holy Spirit, Uh, in whom we have a relationship with the Father. In other words, just as we don't confuse the ministry of Christ, the things that he did, with Christ himself, we don't confuse the function of the Holy Spirit with the Holy Spirit. And people will believe that because the Holy Spirit isn't continually functioning on earth as he did Within that first century time frame, that 40 years that we've spoken about before, that it means we are void of a relationship with the Holy Spirit. That logic is not sound. It's not valid. Because Christ came to the earth, had a certain function and purpose to die for mankind, and he doesn't do that anymore. Yet everyone acknowledges that is, everyone who is a believer, acknowledges a relationship with the Father. Christ doesn't have to continue to die over and over and over again for that to take place. And neither does the Holy Spirit have to continue functioning as the earnest of the Spirit in terms of actively working miracles through the apostles and believers in order for him to or us to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. So now let's look in Genesis chapter 38 so we get an idea of what the earnest is all about. Now, this is from the story of Judah and Tamar. And Tamar was promised Judah's son in marriage. And Starting in verse 11 of Genesis 38, the scripture says, Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house till my son Shelah is grown. For he said, Lest he also die like his brothers. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. And now in the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. And Judah was comforted and went up to his sheep shearers at Timnah, he and his friend Hira the Adullamite. And it was told Tamar, saying, Look, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So she took off her widow's uh, garment, covered herself with a veil, and wrapped herself, and sat in an open place, which was on the way to Timnah, for she saw that Shelah was grown, and she was not given to him as a wife. Now when Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot, because she had covered her face. And then he turned to her by the way and said, Please let me come in to you, for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. So she said, What will you give me 
that you may come into me. And he said, I will send a young goat from the flock. So she said, will you give me a pledge till you send it? Now, there's the key word that we want to focus on. Notice that when he came into her, he promised her a goat in payment for her services. And so he said to her, I will send a young goat from the flock. This is verse 17. And then she said, see, that's a promise that he made to her. And the promise was that he was going to send her a goat from the flock. So she said, will you give me a pledge till you send it? Now, the pledge is a promise that was in lieu of that which had been initially promised or the larger promise of the goat. So she wanted some token from him to ensure that he would deliver the goat to her at a later time. And so then he said, um, what pledge shall I give you? So she said, your signet and cord and your staff that is in your hand. Then he gave them to her and went in to her, and she conceived by him. Now notice that he gave her not the goat at this time. The goat was the payment for the services. But what he gave her, since he didn't have the goat in his back pocket, he didn't have it with him around his neck, and so she gave he gave her something of value that indicated a pledge that he would later deliver on the promise of the goat. That's the way the Arabon is used. It's not the actual blessing, but it was something temporary given until the true blessing was received. And the true blessing here being the goat. And so notice, the scripture again says, will you give me a pledge till I send it or till you send it? And he said, what pledge shall I give you? She said, so your signet, your cord, and your staff that is in your hand. Now, it wasn't the signet, the cord, and the staff that she really wanted. She wanted the goat. That's what was promised. That's what was more valuable to her in this case. But he gave her that to back up his promise. That was the collateral behind the promise so that she knew that he was serious about giving her the goat. And that is the way the word pledge is used. That's the earnest. That's the arabone. That's the guarantee that he would deliver on that goat. Now, when you go back to Ephesians and you read the text, and it says, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. See, that tells you that the Holy Spirit was involved in the promise. The promise, therefore, is not the Holy Spirit in this case. It was something promised by and through the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit was the guarantee of our inheritance. So it's the inheritance, just like it was the goat in the case of Tamar, it's the inheritance that was the real promise of God. And so God gave them the earnest of the Spirit until the inheritance was received, until the redemption of the purchased possession, to the praise of his glory. Now, let us ask ourselves, what was this purchase possession? But before we even answer that question, let's go back and take a look at the actual example of what God gave them so that we can see that the earnest of the Spirit involved the miraculous gifts of the Spirit. When you look at the forming of the church at Ephesus in Exodus 19, The Bible says 
In verse 1, And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper region, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now why is he asking them this? Because according to Mark chapter 17, or excuse me, Mark chapter 16 and verse 17, the scripture says these signs will follow those who believe. And therefore they would speak with tongues and exercise other miraculous gifts of the Spirit. So when Paul passed through Ephesus, he found certain disciples and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? If you didn't hear about the Holy Spirit, then into what were you baptized? Because the Holy Spirit was received in connection with their baptism. And they said, into John's baptism. Now, there was no Holy Spirit blessing promised to those who were baptized unto John. John baptized, as the scripture says, uh, Paul indeed said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him. That is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they believe, uh, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So look at that statement. The blessing of the Holy Spirit, these miraculous gifts, were not associated with the ministry of John the Baptist. They were associated with the ministry of Christ. And when they heard that, the Bible says they were told that, uh, and John said to them, that they were to believe on him who would come after him. So the gifts of the Holy Spirit are connected with the ministry of Christ who came after John. And thus in verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, now there's the medium through which the Holy Spirit was given. It was through the laying on of the apostles' hands, just as it is taught in the eighth chapter of the book of Acts. When Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. Now let's note, when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. This is the effect, this is the result of the Holy Spirit coming on these disciples through the laying on of an apostle's hands. And they spoke with tongues and they prophesied. So these are the gifts. This is the earnest of the Spirit. It referred to those gifts that were given as they were promised in Mark 16, 17 and following. It refers to the gifts they received through the laying on of the apostles' hands. And those gifts were the pledge. They were the earnest of the Spirit until the redemption of the purchased possession. They were not to last without end. They were only to last until the inheritance was given. Now let's look at what the purchase possession was in the next chapter, which is Acts chapter 20. In Acts the 20th chapter and verse 28, Paul, speaking to the elders at Miletus, made the following statement. He says, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among who, or among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know that after, or I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Now notice what he said that the purchase possession was. He said, 
the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. So the purchased possession is the church of God. That is why the earnest was given, because they were inheriting the body of Christ. And the body of Christ, of course, is spoken of as the kingdom. It is spoken of as their inheritance. It is the spiritual body. This is what they were inheriting. And the earnest of the Spirit, the miracles, were given for that purpose. Now let us note from the fourth chapter of Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 4, the Scripture says, and this is verse twenty. Um, uh, verse 30, the scripture says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So they were sealed for the day of redemption. That day of redemption would come when the temple fell, when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans because that is the time that all things written were fulfilled. Luke chapter 21, verses 20 through 22. But in connection with that event, Luke tells us that that was the time of redemption. Luke chapter 21 and verse 28. The very same chapter, he tells us that that was the time of redemption. So he says to the apostles, and when you see all these things, and those are the things that are enumerated in the 21st chapter of Luke and the parallel chapters of Matthew 24 and Mark 13. He said, and when you see these things, or when these things begin to come to pass, look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draws near. Remember when the Lord told them in John chapter 16 that in the world they would have sorrow? and tribulation, but to be of good cheer because he had overcome the world. And he told them that later, even though at that time they would lament and be sorrowful, but he says later they would rejoice. And he gave the illustration of the tribulation of the woman in travail and pain. And yet uh, when the child is born, she forgets the anguish and pain because the child has been brought into the world. So this was an illustration and an analogy of the new creation that was coming about, of the inheritance that God was giving them, and that was through the work of the Holy Spirit. And he tells them, do not grieve the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. So the sealing of the Holy Spirit only continued until that day of redemption. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25 says, Not the forsaking of the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. They saw that day approaching in their lifetime. As a matter of fact, in Hebrews 10 and verse 37, he says, For he who is coming will come and will not delay in a very, very little while. That's the same little while that Jesus talked about in John chapter 16. Well, it looks like we're out of time, and I certainly have enjoyed bringing the message to you, and I hope that you have been enlightened from the message. We're going to continue these studies on the Holy Spirit, but I want to encourage you to purchase our book, which is Have You Spoken in Tongues? It's a book about the Holy Spirit that goes into detail in uh, this matter of these gifts, how they were given, when they were given, and why they were given, and the extent in terms of time in which they were given. So you'll get more information uh, in that book. You can purchase it at Amazon.com. Until next time, this is William Bell with All Bible Prophecy Fulfilled saying, have a very pleasant day and may God bless you. Thank you for listening and we look forward to being back with you at the next appropriate time.